further ado, we have uh, Ad Astra for Aspra Koha Administration in Kansas. Uh, this is uh, being presented by Jason Robb, Michael Adamic, George Williams, and Eric Gustafson, who's online with us, and they will take it away. Um, is Eric? I, he, I think so. Eric, can you hear us? Can you say perfectly? Something? Yeah, I can hear you. Awesome. And there's Eric. There's his face right there. <laughs> Hello. We did it. All right. Presentation's over. <laughs> so today our topic is Goa administration. The title of the presentation is Ad Astra for Aspera which is perfect because it's the state motto of Kansas and also space related, which is the theme of the conference. Um, Ad Astra for Astra means to the stars with difficulty. So um, I think that's probably been all of our experiences a little bit with co-administration over the years. Um, we've got uh, three, I don't know, you guys have all been running class since 2008. I've been running since 2008. How long have you been on, Eric? Oh, probably. That would have been 2008 also. So collectively, we've we've been using it for a while. <laughs> um, so really the, the idea behind this presentation is just to sort of show you what similarities and differences that we have. Um, we're all consortia in Kansas, but some of the stuff we do is very different. Um, and hopefully teach you from our blog <laughs> uh, and answer any questions that um, we can. With, with those years of experience. Um, to get started, I added a little map of Kansas for those unfamiliar. Let me, let's watch the stars sparkle a little bit. <laughs> I just want to point out that uh, Eric has been on Koha since 2008, but how long have you been on the good community Koha? Oh. Well, let's see. Uh, probably just three, four years now. Four years this fall. Yes, I've does. been on several flavors. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was one of our difficulties. We we all had a little experience with that. So that, that was a difficulty at next uh, at Nichols. Citrus flavored company. That's what they call it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about that today, though. Um, so here's my map of Kansas. So you can kind of see what our breakdown is like. Um, there are seven regional systems in Kansas. The three of us are from regional systems. Eric is on his own. Uh, he went out on his own outside of his regional system and started his consortia. So he's a little bit different, a lot different in that way. Um, <laughs> so I'm from Southeast down here in the Southeast corner. It, it, it really makes sense because it's directional. So <laughs> uh, George is in the Northeast corner and then Eric, er, Eric's South Central, Michael's Central, not North Central, North Central got its own little sliver. I don't know how they decided. I think it was population. I don't know how they decided <laughs> the lines, but that's our lines. So you can see that three of the, the four of the systems um, have representation with co-op. There are also standalone standalone co-op installations out there. So like we've got uh, Labatt County in our system. I know Central, the line is running on Koha, right? So there, there are other Koha installations, but today we're kind of talking from the stance of consortia managing Koha. So hopefully it's not too boring for like standalone people. Um, and what we did was just come up with some topics and then we're just gonna like toss it around. So more of a conversation than a presentation. So the first topic that we came up with was administrative structure. So we want to talk a little bit about regional systems versus can share. So for us in Southeast Kansas, we um, offer this as a service to our libraries uh, for a shared automation consortium. And uh, that's basically what we're all doing with it. Yeah, that's uh, in uh, Neckles, uh, almost all of the public library members of Northeast Kansas library system are members of Next Search Catalog. Not all of them, but most of them. And the ones that aren't are usually the really big libraries like Kansas City, Kansas, uh, Lawrence, Topeka, are really large uh, library systems. And uh, we are, our biggest member is 
Leavenworth, which I think has about 30,000 patrons and about 80,000, 80 or 90,000 items. Our smallest library has a town population of about 200 and a collection size of uh, about four or 5,000 items. And CKLS is uh, fairly similar to that. We've got 17 counties, 54 libraries that are on COHA. And of those, the majority are one person libraries. And so um, some of them are only open 20 hours a week. Our smallest town is 69 people that has a library. Um, our largest is 30, uh, 30 to 40,000. And size wise, we are 49 libraries, uh, 48 public, one uh, community college, and we have a 15 county area that we spend. So we are in multiple counties and can share, but we're a little different. We're eight libraries, mostly in Sedgwick County, which is where Wichita is in Kansas, one of the cities you might know where it is. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, our, our regional library system was not interested in hosting a shared consortium, so we created our own. Now, I, I don't know if you want me to talk about that now, Jason, or wait until we move down. Uh, sure, go for it. Well, essentially, we all wanted to share materials, and we were looking for a way to do that. So we started a consortium with two premises that you would uh, be on the courier and that you would share all your new items. Uh, and those are the primary two rules of our consortium. Um, we don't really have an overarching manager or management structure. A derby as the library holds the contract with Bywater uh, and is the primary point of contact on contact is we're the largest library uh, in a town of about 25,000 people. It's a suburb of Wichita. Um, our smallest library is in Rose Hill, and that's around 2,000, maybe a little less uh, people than that. So uh, we, uh, we are kind of an opt-in arrangement. Uh, we invited people to join us, and uh, we continue to seek new members. And as, so moving down to origins and creation. So as far as the, I think all of us are sort of have the same origin, but we kind of came to it at the same time from different angles. Um, so for, for Southeast Kansas, we had a, there's a consortium run by a university down there and we were in the, the pro process of all getting on to their consortium. And then they switched to uh, proprietary software who consists that, um, <laughs> cost like astronomical amounts. So that's when we started researching um, other options, wound up landing on Koha. Um, and then there was a statewide initiative at the time to automate. So there were grants through LTA. Um, so we, we brought up a, a small batch of libraries and then over time have grown. Yeah, and for us, um... You know, I didn't actually work at Eccles when the consortium was created. I worked in, in another state, uh, but it was the same kind of situation. And unlike Eric, who had the good sense to say, here are the rules. You all have to be on the courier. You all have to share all your, you know, your new items and as much as possible. There was an effort on the part of Eccles in order to help get libraries to buy in. They said, well, you know, if you don't want to share those brand new things, we can write some kind of exception where you don't have to share until the items are like 60 days old. And so we're still fighting with trying to get everybody on board with um, with sharing everything all the time as much as possible. We do have a lot of things that, that don't share. Um, a lot of our libraries um, check out like cake pans and things that aren't courier friendly. And that's one other thing that is probably different from a lot of states that I should mention is that Kansas does have a statewide library courier program uh, managed at the Nichols office, but it's for the benefit of all seven regional library systems and any library, any public library in the state of Kansas can join and, uh, and be a member of that courier system. So that's, I know that's something that's completely alien where I came from in Idaho to Kansas. So there's nothing like that in Idaho. And regarding the, the way things are set up, um, Eric's is very decentralized. Most of our systems are much more centralized. Um, we have administration. We are the administrators of the catalog. And one of the interesting things, um, if you're looking to set up a consortium, what CQLS did at first, it was kind of a tough sell for some of our libraries. And so we basically told the libraries, yeah, you can do whatever you want, just join our, our consortium. And originally, they were supposed to be charged a uh, portion of the maintenance fees. 
And we never actually build them for that. So CQLS has been paying all of that. And so that's given us basically the leverage to, over the past few years, start to pull back some of that authority. Um, and we're still very much local control. Local control is our primary, primary um, directive. Directive, thank you. <laughs> but we also are very serious about resource sharing. And that's something where standardization is very important. And so we've kind of gone through a journey of becoming a bit more centralized over the past decade or so. And that's sort of a recurring theme is like, it's easier to give than it is to take away. So like, and I think we've all suffered from that a little bit where we, we've given too much leeway because we want them to join our consortiums and then taking that away. So like, we'll talk about catalog structure later, but I had 1200 shop locations at one point. <laughs> so like, it's a pain to clean that sort of stuff up. So if you can avoid it from the get-go, avoid it from the get-go. Just saying 1200 count, count just, 1200 showing locations makes me want to go over in my bag where I know there's some tongues. <laughs> um, talking about fee structures, so for us, we do have heavily subsidized both the courier service and Koha. The system pays the bulk of that. Um, but we wanted to set it up initially so that those libraries um, were budgeting for a system. So in the, in the event that something happened, they knew that they had to have money set aside. It's not very much money. Um, our our fee structure is based on institutional budget, where like the smallest libraries pay a hundred bucks and the biggest pay a thousand, and they get a discount if they come to our users groups. So um, it's not much, but that gives them like possession and makes them feel more um, involved. I guess more they have ownership over it if they're giving us some money. Yeah, that's Neckles is kind of the same way. Our our fee structure is based on the library's annual budget. And the smallest fee is, I think, four fifty a year, and it goes all the way to about five thousand a year. And unlike uh, unlike CKLS, where they never build anybody, we've always built people, but we never raised the price since two thousand eight. The prices remain uh, absolutely stable, and we've talked every now and then about raising that price. And and uh, Honestly, that's one of the things that scares the hell out of the libraries is the idea that we could raise the price in the future. Yeah, our fee structure, we had to make up something. So it is based on the number, <laughs> the, the number of records that you had when you joined the consortium. So uh, we took the total maintenance cost in our contract. Uh, I created a sliding scale. So our smallest library pays around $750 a year. Uh, up onto Derby pays the most as we have way more than everybody else in the consortium. Uh, El Dorado is probably our next largest city and they probably had 50, 60,000 records. Derby had 120 some thousand when we started. So again, we're all in Kansas, we're all consortium, we're all doing things a little bit different. So um, flexibility and co-op. <laughs> uh, <laughs> one thing I did want to mention real quickly is as far as the centralized structure, it can be very easy, especially for those of us who don't have the daily interaction with patrons, to get kind of an ivory tower mentality where you think, oh, this is a great idea. I'm sure my libraries will love this. And then you roll it out and realize that libraries that are actually on the front lines, sometimes it's not so helpful. And so we created a, a group called the Pathfinder Trailblazers. And it's basically an advisory committee formed of librarians that help to provide input on changes. And so I can get some feedback on whether this, this is actually helpful or not. So what, what Michael just described is a democracy. Um, <laughs> what I describe mine as is a Jason Tater, <laughs> which is a modified dictator model. Um, we, we, do, uh, we do largely get input from our libraries, but we we hold the final decision making power on everything because we are offering this as a service we're not my my old boss always used to say we're not a consortium we're not truly a consortium we're we're just a group um it's a service that we offer so we can manage it that way um but it keeps people happy if you love them having but for sure uh so so when we have to do things like making policy changes or updates um we do convene committees and things like that and then we do bring things to the user group as a whole to make decisions for the week. 
for the most part, but for the like little stuff, like upgrades specifically, we'll go through and kind of filter out everything that we don't want to use um, and don't want to even mess with before we, uh, our our letters are CA. So that's sort of how we handle decision making. And I'm kind of somewhere in between the two here. Um, one of the things that actually, as being somebody, the consortium existed for uh, eight years before I came to it. And so being somebody coming in from the outside, um, I was able to bring the perspective of, well, that's crazy. Why the hell do you do that? Let's change it. Um, <laughs> and that was that helped me a lot, certainly. And that was kind of more leaning towards Jason's dictatorship. Uh, but most of the things I try to defer to the to the members and get input on before we before we make any kind of crazy decisions. We're about as democratic as you can get, though. There may be some uh, changes that are omitted to be mentioned to the group at whole. Um, we do we do meet quarterly as library directors, and then if we need policy changes or decision making, then we negotiate it out. During which I have been called the most pushy person some other director has ever met. But uh, there there may be uh, not unilateral. It's not unilateral. There's definitely some pressure at times. So. We can move on to our next slide topic. So this one is patrons, um, patron categories and attributes. So for us, we've kept those very limited. Anything that touches circulation and fine rules, I want very little of those. So patron categories and item types are as pared down as possible. Uh, attributes, attributes slow things down. Um, so we try to avoid using them as well. We have kind of a mishmash. Um, I've tried very hard. Since I've been in Kansas, we've gotten rid of, I think we're at about uh, 40 patron categories right now. But when I got here, there were about 50 or 55. And a lot of them just didn't make sense. And uh, But it's the same kind of idea. The more stuff you have, you know, one time I did a calculation because you figure that um, circulation rules are based on the the library where the item is checking out is the way we have it set up, and then the patron category, and then um, the uh, item type. And one time I did the math to figure out the number of libraries times number of item types times number of patron categories, and it was astronomical. And that the bigger that number is, the harder it is to to keep those rules sustainable because you always have somebody saying, you know, I want this item to only check out to adults. Uh, and, and this is the item, and, and they've only got like four of the items. You know, this this one thing is going to be different. And then the more patron categories you have, the harder that is to implement. Um, so we try to limit them, and I brought the number down, but but it can be difficult. Yeah, I think we've got twenty twenty four, um, and I could get rid of some more of those. One of the things that we didn't understand in the beginning and why we had 1200 shelf locations is that, uh, well, and like back then you couldn't limit by branch. So they were creating shelf locations. This is before me, so I don't get to take credit for this. Uh, the, they were creating shelf locations for every library. Um, same thing with the patron categories. We have some patron categories and they're still that are specifically labeled for reporting purposes. Um, when we set up our consortium, it, it wasn't as patron focused as it should have been. We weren't looking at how we were serving the patrons. We were looking at how easy it would be to run reports so that they fit with the state survey. Um, so a lot of what I've done is try to move away from that. Um, but like we have one that's supposed to track in town, out of town, which we could easily do with a zip code report rather than a patron category. So just thinking of other ways to approach the data to sort of reduce your numbers is good. We have probably less than 20. We try to keep it pretty limited. Jason, we do that out of in town, out of town for the people who use a sort one or sort two field adapted so the libraries can select. But um, mostly it's just patron and juvenile patron. We have a few uh, other categories that are as broad as we can make them. So multiple libraries can use some of those categories like an outreach, like a, like a delivery uh, category. We did have to approach uh, patron categories. One of the issues that we were running into is that libraries have different policies on DVD circulation. Uh, some of our libraries came from systems that allowed you to restrict 
DVD cat checkouts by area. Uh, but not every library wanted to do that. So we ended up having to create a restricted juvenile patron category. And then we managed to convince the directors to have the patrons that were concerned opt into that category uh, if they wanted to prevent their children from checking out DVDs or certain areas of DVDs. So um, this kind of gets into some of the other stuff on this slide. Uh, so we want to talk about like privacy, what kind of data we keep, that sort of thing, um, how we're uh, controlling that sort of thing. So we all have our own privacy policies. Some are more extensive than others that we've written. Um, I know Eric doesn't use guarantors and guarantee relationships. I think the rest of us do. I think when we were meeting before, this was the one where I was like, oh yeah, if they give me a feature, I'll try it. Um, so I have set up the, the, the like some of the adult relationships because I've had that request. Um, whereas some of us are more cautious about that sort of stuff, like I should be. Um, but as far as private information, I think all of us are trying to do our best to keep as little data as possible, right? I mean, that's sort of the, uh, that's the goal. a pillar of librarianship, right? Like we don't want to keep their driver's license number. We absolutely don't need it. We we had a conversation about gender and George can talk about that. Well, yeah, um, for years and years, Next Search Catalog was keeping, uh, using the male, female, NA switches. Not consistently though, uh, when people would sign up for a library card, depending on who was working, they would remember to, to click M or click F. And recently in Kansas, a law passed that said, uh, if a government agency, which most of our public libraries are government agencies, if we collect this data, then this data must follow the patron's uh, gender, biological gender as reported on the birth certificate, which essentially means that when somebody comes to get a library card, in order to make sure that you're not violating this law, you have to see the patient's birth certificate. So we got rid of that uh, We uh, with the last upgrade. This is what I call a stealth upgrade. Um, when we did the last, when Bywater pushed us the last upgrade, I just um, turned off that field so our staff no longer sees it. And I said, it's a feature. <laughs> So the, that was the first step is I disabled that field so, so staff can no longer record that data. And now I'm in the process of uh, getting rid of the data that, that's, that's already recorded there. Um, but uh, that's an issue too with, um, uh, I was worried about the new pronoun field. I didn't turn that on for the same reason it could potentially in the future be weaponized against patrons by my big brother, I guess, would be the, the way to describe it. In the past, when I would gotten to Kansas, um, they had just gone through a big process of eliminating the driver's license. I think you know, it used to be recorded in the sort one field of our, in our system. And the person before me had just finished a big process of telling libraries, you can't add that information to the database. Um, so there are still libraries that record that. They, they're just recording on a piece of paper that they have filed away in some ridiculous drawer. Or a whole bunch of um, paper records. Um, but that's something that I'm always concerned about is privacy and trying to go through what new features might cause privacy issues or what data we've already got that might cause privacy issues. One of the things that's really important for us is that every single person who has access to the staff catalog, whether it's volunteer or a staff member, they have to sign that privacy agreement because. Even if it's just a board member who's volunteering, they're going to see patron information and they need to understand just how important that privacy is to us. Yeah, we have that too. We don't allow anybody to access staff access unless they're a staff member. Yeah, ours isn't quite as strict. We do, we, so we've been around since 2008 and just last year and uh, like came up with a participation agreement that they have to sign every year. Um, but we require that the director, whoever's in charge, signs off on the fact that they're in charge of their people and they're in charge of training their people. And if, if something is to happen, that's coming back on them. Um, we also serve as the database administrator in our privacy policy. So um, if 
the police come with a subpoena or something, our libraries have to direct that to us. They're not allowed to deal with that themselves, it's which true. most of them are relieved to hear when we tell them. <laughs> um, anything else on the slide you guys want to talk about? I think we covered it all. You better keep it moving, Jason. We'll never get there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> We're all kind Jason of chatty. Told, originally, Jason told the three of us that this was going to be a uh, half hour presentation. And, and then it magically it, turned into a one hour presentation. Well, yeah, I said a half hour. How, how can we fill this in half an hour? And then when we found out it was an hour, I said, how are we going to fill a whole half hour? Don't worry, I got a lot of slides. We could probably go for two hours. Yeah. <laughs> um, so next on the list is catalog structure. So this is, we've kind of touched on this already, talking about how we use collection codes differently than shelf locations and item types. So for us, our structure is sort of collection codes are the most broad. So adult book, juvenile book, DVDs, um, we raise have their own. There's, there's not a lot. Um, and those are our main reporting categories for like brief information. That's what our, our libraries usually use to, to do their monthly um, board reports. And then shelf locations get way more granular. So that's going to be our adult fiction, juvenile fiction, uh, juvenile easy books, that sort of thing. Um, I do have them down to less than 200 now. Uh, and again, like before, before we couldn't branch limit those things. So it's it's even more restrictive now because I can if I do need to set up something special for a library I can restrict it so only they can use it. Um, we also have very limited item types, although I've been letting the creep get in on those. So like um, ours are just like book, and um, then I have a new book so that I can facilitate sharing of new items differently than sharing of regular items. Um, and then like visual media, audio media, and then I've been, the creep is for local items. So our libraries have been growing their library of things collections. There's stuff that they don't want to be able to send on the courier, but they want their patients to play salt on. So I have to have special item types to facilitate that. And our, our structure is very similar to the way Jason, Jason's is set up. Um, and we kind of use the collection code almost as a sort of genre classification. And so if you're running reports, that's kind of your genre. If you want to know how something is, is going in that specific genre. And I don't mean mystery, things like that. I mean, fiction, nonfiction, movies. So all of the DVDs and Blu-rays are all under one. Um, the item types, again, that's the one we want to be the most limiting on. Um, for a while, we had hardback book, paperback book, spiral bound book. All of those were item types. And we've been working on a book is a book is a book. And so you just need one item type for that. And of course the shelving locations, thankfully we never had 1200, but we've got things like fire truck and yellow shell and all of those as shelving locations because one library's got that. <laughs> and for us, um, our classification, the most broad form is uh, where it starts home library, uh, shelving location, item type collection code, call numbers, so what direction we go. And so we only have three shelving locations, adult, children's, and young adult. Um, and that makes reporting really easy. And then the item types, we have some more controls over those. Uh, but where we have the most uh, stuff is in collection codes, which is a great place to have more stuff because it doesn't affect circulation rules. That's why when somebody proposed, hey, let's make uh, collection codes part of the circulation rules, I just said, God, no, that would be, that's, that's crazy that we just, that we have library times, category times, item time, the number would be in the billions for, for a lot of libraries. Yeah, that sound that sounds awful. We start. We are in the reverse. We item type is our most restricted. We have limited item types. We allow a little more expansion on collection codes, though we had a heck of a long marathon meeting to negotiate calling everything the same thing. Uh, across all the libraries yeah. and I let them kind of free wheel with the shelving location that allows them if they want to use a paperback shelving location so they can they can figure out they can sort those out separately at their library that's where we allow them to do that and then we just hide the uh the sorting and searching for shelving location on the patron side of the OPAC and that, that sort of brings us to the next set of bullet points there. So driving factors, and I touched on this earlier, 
So like our structure originally was sort of not fully, but mostly based around reporting and the all powerful state survey that we have to fill out. Um, so we wanted to be able to pull those numbers easily for that. Um, since we've been I put these in order how I want them. So searching is most important, I think, because that's what's important to the patron, being able to access your collection. Um, so formulating these things in such a way that the patron can look, understand it, like our old item types, we, we have item types exposed in the search category, because why not? Because they do make sense. It's book, it's visual media. Our old ones were things like 1D to our $1X. <laughs> wow. So like, yeah. So <laughs> I can think of that. So it's like one day checkout, two renews, dollar fine, or something like that. So like, but so, yeah. yeah. So we did away with that entirely. Um. So the the item types are used for the patrons because we're doing it for the patrons. I mean, yes, we need to make it easier to manage on our end so that we can serve them better. But they it's for them. Um, categorization again, just getting things in the right places for, for people. So it's easy to understand where they're at and then reporting last. So like, like our shelf location dilemma was easily resolved by using some SQL that could just combine shelf locations. I mean, like, I don't, I don't have to have a shelf location just so I can run the numbers. And that's, that was sort of just our growth over time. And understanding what we could actually do with SQL um, as opposed to just trying to make what co-op can do work easily. So, um, yeah. And one of the things that's nice about open source is that Koha originally was not very friendly to consortiums, but over time, there's been so many developments that have made it much more friendly to consortiums. And that kind of shows just how flexible it is over time. And how do you prevent bloat? Uh, just be mean like me. <laughs> and pushy, pushy. <laughs> Sorry, Eric, what was that? Just, just be pushy. Yeah, be pushy. Um, yeah, I mean, that really is the bottom line. Like, <laughs> if they ask for something, I always try to look at it a different way. Like, do you really need a shelf location for that? If we can put it in this, it sounds vaguely similar. Probably not. We decided not to uh, use the word pivot, but, uh, <laughs> but I think we're going to. Uh, oh, I, I no, wait, I got it here. You got it here. Twirl away from that. <laughs> um, all right. Circulation rules are an asteroid field, as illustrated here. <laughs> um, Synchronization versus local control. So we are, local control is one of our guiding tenants as well. So we try as much as we can to boil things down and have everybody running on the same thing, but every one of my libraries has their own set of sort of rules. Um, we haven't, we've broached the topic multiple times of, hey, let's all just have one set of sort of rules for the consortia. And it's just, it's not going to happen under me because I'm really not pushy enough. Um, <laughs> but if if you can pull that off, it makes your life a ton easier because you have that many less rules to manage. Before I came to Kansas, I worked for the Lake Tuck County Library District in Idaho with the Valmet Extortion. And if we would have these, we were a lot more democratic, like the system that Eric is running uh, in Kansha there. And we would have these uh, regular circulation meetings and we all agree, everybody agreed when I would say, let's just make all of the circulation rules the same for all of the libraries. And they said, yes, I agree with that so long as they are exactly the way my library keeps <laughs> so, so I had the other directors when we were setting this up came to me and they said, well, wouldn't it be so great for the patrons if we synchronized our circulation rules? And let me tell you to have those meetings, even with eight people to try to get them to agree on everything is, is that's probably where the pushiness tag came from. We did agree at some point, we don't require that in our consortium. We could certainly allow an academic library to join uh, and set their own CERC rules. We're not opposed to that, uh, but it does make it a lot of easier, especially when we're in like a Metro area for most of us. Uh, if you if you're roaming from multiple libraries, like many of our patrons do, 
Uh, it allows them a lot of flexibility uh, and not to be horribly confused. So we have very few uh, circulation rules. Uh, most of them are defined as a group, though we do have some local library for special items, for cake pans, for American girl dolls, for, you know, those things that, that they make me, people ask me, are you going to get those? And I'm like, well, you could just go to Andover. They have them. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question over here. So, more of a comment. Um, we're in a giant consortium of three, and and we can't agree. I <laughs> certainly so. I mean, unless you really are a dictator, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> just got to be really pushy enough to make people irritated with you. Well, I know my friends. <laughs> and for us, we're coming from a situation where those CERC policies are written in the policy at each of these libraries. So if we're going to push that, it's going to have to be like a huge change. And people are already change averse. I work with a lot of small rural one-person libraries like Michael does. They're often run by little old ladies and people that don't get paid enough um, to even broach that sort of colossal change. So um, we want to keep them as happy as we can, I would say. Um, so we just kind of go with the flow on this. Um, fine free versus fining. We encourage fine free again because that makes less rule work for us. But really, it's better for the patrons. Not, it's not about me, right? Um, <laughs> but but yeah, uh, well, we still have, I'd say, a handful of libraries that are fining. But I always tell the ones that don't find and their circle is 14 days to renew whatever for everything that I love them the most. <laughs> I actually, when we have our um, about four times a year, not necessarily quarterly, but we have user group meetings uh, four times a year. And uh, somebody will always bring up the question of fines. And so I actually have a report that I run in the meeting that says, these are the libraries that still have fines to kind of shame those <laughs> out of 40, 50 libraries, there are, there are only three that still have fines. By running that report live in the meeting and saying, well, these are the libraries that still have fines. So, <laughs> um, and at my last meeting, one of them said, you know, we don't charge fines anymore. So I, it it. Works. I, I haven't had the time yet to uh, do the work on that, but we're almost down to just two libraries right now. I need to revise my no name and shame policy at users groups, it sounds like. <laughs> I'm not shaming anybody, I just run the report. The report is shaming them, right? We've only got one library that's still charging clients, and so hopefully that's not too long. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if you have a shared, uh, we have a program we call One Pop and One Card, and that's where a patron can get a card at any library, and they use that, that same account at any other library. That works really well because they don't have to get a card at every single library. The, that is going to be a problem, though, if you do have libraries that charge fines, because it can get really messy if they start racking up fines at different libraries and try to check out another. So that's an argument for going fine free as well. Yeah, I have a whole page in my policy manual about dealing with what if they charge if got to rack up a fine over there and they're coming here and trying to use your library and how do you clean it up? And um, yeah, doing away with fines would do away with all of that. Um, we also have to write policy on what do you do if they pay the fine over there? Do I have to send the money? And we have to come to agreements on that as well. Yeah, we are all fining libraries with all the same fine rule structure. Uh, we would probably not be a fining library if I had my choice, but as we are larger, uh, much larger than some of the other libraries, if we were the only one to go fine free, we would definitely some, see some patron siphoning. Um, we were kind of started discussions about when we'll want to make that move at some point. Um, but that is the uh, that is one of the downsides of being a democracy is that I only have one vote. Uh, and so it, it'll take me a few more years. We do have very simplistic uh, rules for handling people paying fines in their library. We are one card also. Uh, but if you pay fines at another library, that other library just keeps them and your account's active. We've all agreed on that. Uh, and if it's like, if it's lost items, uh, then we just shoot an email. Then the, the person, whenever you're with your processing, everyone has a procedure for handling their lost items. You just notify the collection person at the other library and say, hey, someone paid for all these items. Do you want us to replace them? It, that's that's all of our, pretty much all of our fine policy boiled down into like less than a paragraph. Mm -hmm. Keep it simple. 
Um, the last thing on our list here is local usage hold settings, which I, I guess I sort of touched on. We we do lean on those pretty heavily as far as like making things available to people locally, but not to the consortium. Um, we do that for our new items as well. We've talked about the sharks and the fishes in the past, if you know what that's about, but basically it's our new, <laughs> new item sharing policy. Um, and we enjoyed figuring that out because that, that opened the door for other libraries that were hesitant to join um, because they didn't want to lend their new items immediately um, to, to reconsider joining. Um, it's a concession. We would we would love to be like Eric's consortium where everybody shares everything all at once, but um, we were happy to figure out a way to make it work with Koha where we could enforce um, reciprocity, basically. If you don't share your new stuff, you can't borrow other people's new stuff, that sort of thing. We we have we still have a policy on the books that says um, uh, when you get new things, each library has the option if they buy multiple copies to put half of the copies on a local hold only. Um, but there's no way to enforce that really, um, which means. But since the addition of the local holds priority system preference, almost every library has given that up. Um, if they've stopped using that item type that allowed that creates that condition where things can be local hold only. Um, and I've only got a couple of real holdouts, and I have come up with some jQuery that will enforce that policy that I plan on doing as a stealth upgrade <laughs> the next time. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that, and I'm looking forward to those two libraries saying, how come I can't? Use that item type anymore. And I, I will be able to say that item type will only appear if you have more than one copy, and it will only allow you to put half of them on that item type. So, and I switched the flag because we're literally talking about sharing already. And this is a puzzle game. You guys were supposed to be figuring out what the words were because I put Eric's face at the top. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so we are talking yes. about sharing. We talked about one page and one account already, and we've just talked about new item sharing. Eric, did you have something? Yeah, so we share pretty much everything uh, with no local hold priority, uh, and it's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, we would say we probably have 300, two, 300,000 items in our, somewhere about probably a quarter of a million items in our collection for eight libraries, and I, there are less than 100 items that have a higher than three to one hold ratio, and most of those are American Girl dolls and museum <laughs> passes, which are, are really hard to share. Um, because they won't curry her very well. But uh, as far as the other thing goes, we use the uh, transport cost matrix to uh, trick the holds queue into pulling available books for our libraries first. We just pretend it costs money to send stuff between our libraries, uh, but even though it doesn't. Um, and then if we have like a bookmobile or, you know, a, an unstaffed semi branch like we have, then we, uh, we make that cost even higher even though it doesn't really exist. And we use the whole, uh, the transport cost matrix as well in tandem with the randomization and the calendar. So um, it, it, it's an effort to get things in the patient's hands as fast as possible. So my, my transport cost matrix is based on what courier route are they on, how many days a week are they open relative to each other. Um, and for the most part, it works pretty well. One thing to keep in mind when you're sharing is um, there's a system preference called home or only branch, and that defines which circulation rules an item uses when it gets sent to another library, whether it uses the uh, the circle rules of the checkout library or the circle rules of the home library. And you probably want to have that on the only branch because otherwise it's going to have different circle rules for everything somebody checks out from somewhere else. Um, as far as encouraging sharing, um, I believe the other systems have something similar. We have a Pathfinder interlibrary loan replacement fund. So if someone shares at another library and the item gets lost or damaged, then CKLS reimburses the library for that item. That way they don't have to be afraid to share. We don't have that internally. We do have the, we at SK manage the statewide materials replacement fund. Um, so that's generally what we're using for that sort of thing. Um, but we are in the in talks about 
generating what um, Central has just to create another level of comfort for our library so that they don't feel like they're going to lose stuff without um, getting some sort of reimbursement or replacement for that. The one thing we don't do in Neckles is we do not use the transportation cost matrix. And the reason for that, I, I mean, if we have still have the map up there. Neckles is the smallest system in Kansas, but we account for um, like 42% of the population in the state of Kansas um, because we're uh, most of most of our libraries are within an hour's drive of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, so we don't use the transportation cost matrix because the libraries that we have that are right there closest to Kansas City, which would be Atchison, Leavenworth, Baser, um, Tonganoxie, and Bonner Springs, are all the biggest libraries. And so if we were to use the transportation cost matrix, it would just be essentially those libraries would all be sharing primarily with each other. And that area already has a problem with courier volume, where some days um, without the transportation cost matrix on the uh, the courier loads are so heavy that the couriers don't physically have enough room in their vehicles to get things from library to library. Um, so if we were to turn on the transportation cost matrix, we would just make that situation worse. Um, I put club holds on here because I just wanted to remind everybody that if you haven't looked at club holds or you club holds in your historical setting, you should think about it. Um, this is something that we help develop. It's the way we're using it as like an author club um automatic or automatic i'm the automatic card i'm not the automatic card i offloaded it to my catalogers but um it automatically puts so anytime a new james patterson comes in if the patrons have signed up for the club we go in and place a club hold for it and all those patrons get on that new new record automatically um it's a great service to the patron uh gotten really good positive feedback at it about it so um, i did a presentation on this uh, the McKinney conference. So if you want to know more, you can look there. And now I'm going to whirl to the next slide. Whirl. Yeah. I would just say that I think of clubs holds almost as like a way of uh, doing a routing list for books. I have a couple of libraries that use it. So there's the James Patterson Club of Jason. And so whenever the librarian at that library that uses that sees that there's a new Jason James Patterson book out, she just puts it on hold for the club and then like 60 patrons. That quickly have a hold on it, James Patterson. And the other perk benefit of it is it randomizes. So before it was whichever library got there first, got put their patrons on first in whatever order they wanted. Now, if they're in the club and we put the club hold on, somebody new is getting the, the first book every time. Um, next slide, we're going to talk about maintenance. Uh, I think we just wanted to air grievances about closing branches. <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy. There's a lot of parts that you have to, buttons you have to push and toggles you have to do, and we all have checklists, I think. Yeah, it would be really awesome if Koha had a feature where right now is there's a, in the library record in the administrative module, there's a, a checkbox you can check that says whether this library is a pickup location or not. It would be great if there was a checkbox there that just said this library is closed, mm -hmm. and then it would, uh, uh, you know, the issues we have are, it, would take them out of the drop down for a whole pickup location. It would uh, remove, uh, I, I, there's just a whole, I forget what the list of things we wanted to do is, but um, it would you know, automatically hide all the materials from the OPAC, um, just a whole bunch of steps that we go through. We, we have, in addition to uh, public libraries, our consortium has one school district and one community college. And so when the school district closes for the summer, there's just uh, I have a checklist of like five or six things that I have to do to make sure that people aren't going to be ready to request the items from the school. And then if somebody that has a card at the school district will request an item, it's not going to go to the school that's closed for the summer. So um, are we done at two straight up or when do you want to? We got five minutes. All right. Um, let me whip it to the last slide then. <laughs> That's another synonym for payback. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're going to veer to the last slide. So, so last, slide, last slide, in the event of a cohoplis, how do we manage that? <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think for all of us, 
it, it's all about triaging the problem. Like, what can I do to fix it versus do I have to elevate it to the support vendor? Mm -hmm. um, or can I can I offload it to another staff? So we've got a, like a small team of staff. I've got a, a cataloger and she has an assistant. We've got a resource sharing department and she has an assistant. So, um, and then we have a, a an administrative team with some our library consultants and stuff that meet weekly to talk about issues, including Koha. Um, so, ninety nine percent of the time, it's just me solving <laughs> issues. Um, once in a while, I can divert those off to another staff member. And if it's something that I can't fix, um, then I have I I'm the one person in our entire consortium that people have to come to to get support from my order. Um, we, we chose to keep it closed up that way to keep things simple. We do have a, a staff member on staff as my backup, but uh, hardly ever use that. So 99% of the time you're the, you're the person. Yeah, I'm, I'm not allowed to get hit by blessed. They tell me that every time I walk up. <laughs> so 99% of the time, man, I wish I was not lucky. Um, it's kind of, I'm the, the point of contact uh, between our consortium and Bywater too. And Bywater should really be thanking us for that because <laughs> otherwise there would be like 50 tickets a day um, from our libraries. Um, but that is um, that is uh, something that's changed in Eccles over time. There used to, originally there was a team of people and then one of them, you know, went to a conference in New Zealand and ended up moving there and taking a job there. And, <laughs> you know, and so over time, as the consortium developed, the team got smaller and smaller and smaller and it just came down to just being a one person job. And we're trying to change that a little bit to, you know, have other people involved in Koha more. Um, but that is an issue. And, and the training of new library staff and the training for upgrades and documentation is always, always an issue. And that's always me too. Um, we have two minutes. Did anything else you guys want to add, or we can go to questions? It's a little different. I'll just say for us is we don't. I don't. I would love to have a George or a Michael or a Jason. You know, someone that had time to devote to make enhancements, or you know. But my assistant director and I serve as the triage before things go to Bywater because we like to verify that it's actually an issue with Koha and not something that they're doing incorrectly. Um, so 90% of the stuff we handle uh, without putting a ticket in. Um, but then we do have to elevate a few things to that. So we and we made, made the other directors very comfortable. Hey, just just reach out, email or call us if something's acting strange. We'll take a look and we're pretty swift. So we do share that between the two of us, which does help. Um, so that's 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 good. But yeah, it would be great to have someone. Even your job is to do this. <laughs> I don't know if you like what it is. Um, it's about the same as the what Jason and George do. Um, one time we had a tech travel two hours to plug in a mouse, so that was. That was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the first question is always is your internet working? Because ninety nine percent of the time it's because their internet's on time. We we do live in very very rural areas, so. It's not co it's your internet, guys. One of the other things I'd say about support before we before we I moved it. I, I wheeled it over to Michael. wheeled it over to Plus. <laughs> uh, one, one of the last things I'd say then is um another form of support we have is we have each other. We yeah have a group we meet uh, twice a year usually. Um we call them keggers. Yeah, the Kansas <laughs> the Kansas Explorers group or Cohawk Explorers group. We have a mail list so we can communicate with each other quickly and easily and we meet usually in the spring we meet at one of the member libraries i think uh we met in yeah we did jason's library last night i think it's my turn next i should probably get on that <laughs> and then we meet every year at kla sort of for the last few since since the pandemic i've just been a giant head on the screen because i haven't been kla since uh, 2019 i think but then there's also the Koha US uh, consortium group, which I don't remember the dates of those meetings. And I don't remember who wants them. It's not the one you Bob Rams, is it? I, mean, I thought Bob Rams was a position, but I go to a lot of meetings. I don't remember who's in charge. Uh, 
Uh, I don't, and I don't remember off the top of my head what the schedules are, but we just moved it from like every other month to every month because we were finding we have more stuff to talk about. Fourth Thursday. The fourth Thursday of the month, and it, it's on the uh, Kohan West website. So do we have time for a question? Like, we have time for two questions according to Bob. <laughs> I don't know if there's uh, Christopher's been monitoring the YouTube chat, so are there any questions on there? Uh, no questions, uh, just a few comments real quick, uh, and I'm going to slaughter names, I apologize folks, uh, uh, Janelle, or Janelle, I'm not sure, uh, you said that's my alma mater's motto back at the beginning, uh, Kendall said, go Wichita, Kendall looks the same. <laughs> I lived in Derby for six months back in 2003, a very nice library, and uh, Juliet said, it sounds like Derby's consortium was set up very similar to how ours is in South Dakota. All right. We had a question over here. I thought about Kelly went on. Mine's just curiosity. How many um, clubs is that that you have, Jason? 600 and some right now. <laughs> wow. Um, I, I have it split up into three formats right now. So there's audiobook, um, large print, and then regular print clubs. It's as long as my reports work, it's not hard to manage. We just, they don't always work. Like, it's just don't get hit by a bus, right? No, like, if authors would stop writing as other then everything would be fine. But anything that comes up with Robert Parker's whatever, and it needs to go to the Robert Parker Club, doesn't work because Robert Parker's not in the 100. It's a problem. Anything else? <laughs> What are your member libraries? Like, speaking as a library that left the consortium, that's why we had a whole lot of co ops. We just couldn't handle it. Do you have libraries that want to leave? Do you have libraries that want to join? Like, so we we have a few in the pipe right now that are wanting to join. Um, we did, in our most recent revision, develop a, a removal policy, um, but we've never needed it. It was it's sort of a fallback. For the bulk of our libraries, if they left our consortium, they wouldn't be automated. They're just that, that small, they have tiny budgets. We did have to write in an exit strategy uh, that would allow people required to give us a year notice if they want to leave uh, as we're a democracy and I can't force you to stay. Um, but our libraries are all super happy to be in the consortium uh, and even our reluctant people who are a little bit skeptical or are, are some of the biggest uh, praise singers. We've got uh, two of our biggest libraries are not members of the consortium. They do their own. Um, and then we've got two others who are not, and both of them are looking to join within the next couple of years. And um, Bywater's got a great uh, onboarding team that helps with that. And we do have to like thank Agent Sharon Sherrick for that, because using that to do ILO is very clunky and unenjoyable and doing it in Koha is enjoyable. So like all they have to do is scan it and send it. Um, and just how much more streamlined sharing is in Koha versus our statewide system, like people don't want to lose that, I don't think. Yeah, the Kansas does have a statewide ILL system that's managed by the Kansas State Library and it's run on uh, Share It, which is by other uh, graphics. Yeah. And people hate it. Um, but, <laughs> But um, it's, it's just like 17 clicks to do the one thing yeah. you have to do in Baja. It's it's um, it's really clunky for what the state is trying to do with it. Um, but we, um, as far as libraries leaving, we have only ever had one library leave, and that was uh, one of our school libraries. And the reason they left is because the school district closed the school. Oh. Um, we have almost every library in our region, almost every public library. In our regional state as a member, except for the really big ones. And then we've got this one outlier that their director is just, you know, she wants to do what she wants to do and she doesn't want to be involved. As far as do our members like it, uh, we have many of our libraries are in the same situation as what Michael and Jason said that if they if they didn't have co-op, they wouldn't be automated. Um, somebody mentioned uh one of the earlier. Uh, speakers mentioned they had a library that their annual budget was $32,000 a year. I have a library whose budget is $23,000 a year, and $5,000 of that is a grant that they get from us. So we have a lot of really small libraries in our system, and without Koha, they would not be automated. But with Koha, like their tiny collection is 700,000 items because of us. So, like, 
Yeah, no our, library specifically are never going to want to leave. Our smallest library is in a town of about 200 people. They have a less than maybe 4,000 items in their collection. And um, without without COBA, they wouldn't be automated. But you know, being a member of NECLs, being a member of the system, they get access to other NECL services like uh, uh, consulting from our library consultants. NECLs has a, an architect on retainers. So if the library wants to consult with an architect, we'll pay up to like five hours of that um, from our from our retainer. And we have a lot of other services we offer. And libraries in general are happy with the services offered by the, by the systems. So I think we're over time now. Our contact yeah. information is here. Um, I'm sure all of us would be willing to talk with anyone that has questions. Um, we are all pretty very active in Hawaii well, US. Um, and I think we're, we're very pro community. So like, if we can help build that community with you guys, we're happy to do so. And thanks for joining us, Sarah. You're welcome. Thanks, Sarah. My pleasure.